the March meeting of Tuckahoe Town meeting, which in our topic is the new Henrico County Detox Center and information related to that, and then the internship program. And I chose the internship program because, as you can imagine, it's spring in air. The type of the students in, um, in, in high school, college, and graduate school are looking for internships at this time of year. So I thought it would be good to have that. So, so let's begin a little bit. First of all, if you are watching us on, online, um, look to the right side of your screen. And there is a chat room there. And if you have any questions, type them in and we will answer them. Or if you are unable to get the chat room information to work, you can get me on my phone and, and my email is pob at patobannon.com. And I got one question earlier today and it was not related to our topic. So I went ahead and answered it anyway. Um, <laughs> And um, we have several speakers tonight, and let's see. Oh, if you have a question, the microphone is right there. And please, if you do have a question, use the microphone because we want to make sure we memorialize your question as well as the answer, and that makes the answer more understandable. This is an excellent program. We, we did it earlier today. We had a, a room full of people who asked very interesting questions, and I get the feeling that our speakers will include some of those answers when they give their talk because they were right on point. So um, let's see. The first speaker is going to be Michael Feinmel. He's the Deputy County Manager for Public Safety. Mr. Feinmel began his career with Henrico County as an Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney in 2001. In 2006, he was promoted to Deputy Commonwealth's Attorney overseeing organized crime, narcotics, and human trafficking. In 2022, Mr. Feinmel was named Deputy County Manager for Public Safety. Currently, he has direct responsibilities over the court services units, community revitalization, building construction and inspections, hotel motel task force, and criminal justice associated agencies. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from James Madison University and his Juris Doctor from the University of Richmond. He's also a graduate of Henrico County Public Schools, having graduated from Douglas Freeman High School. Our other speaker on our first topic is Laura Toddy. She is the Executive Director of Mental Health and Devel Developmental Services. She's been the Executive Director since September 2014. She has 39 years of experience with the agency starting out as a residential counselor and serving in many capacities, such as program coordinator, program manager, and director of the clinical and prevention services division before becoming the executive director. Henrico Area Mental Health and Developmental Services provides community-based mental health, development disability, substance use disorder, prevention, and early intervention services to residents of Henrico, New Kent, and Charles City Counties. As director, Laura works with the Community Services Board to oversee an agency with a budget of $50 million and 450 employees. She holds a bachelor's degree in management, housing, and family development from Virginia Tech, and a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from Virginia Commonwealth University. Our speaker on internships is Debbie Lumpkin. She is the internship program coordinator. Ms. Lumpkin has worked for the county for 22 plus years. And tonight she said it's like coming home because she started her career here in the library, in the library communications relations office, moving to human resources in 2007. Debbie has served as the internship program coordinator since 2011. She is passionate about developing the next generation of workforce uh, and supporting students with experiences in which they can put their studies to use and learn what it is to work in their field of study. Success to, to Debbie is when a student identifies both likes and dislikes when, they're, when connecting their studies to their internship, which will help them plan for their future career path. And next, I just want to introduce at the back of the room, we have our community officer, 
Scott Phillips. So let's start with Mr. Feinmill and then go on to Laura Toddy. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, talking about coming home, um, I, I was thinking when, when Ms. Urbana was talking about me going to uh, graduating from Freeman, I, I was before the generation of video games and and everything on TV. There were three channels on TV when I was in school. And, and we, as kids at that time, we didn't really like being at home. So after school, I would usually go to Regency Square for a while and then come here to the library and we would all hang out at the library to the library closed. Of course, the library is a little different than it is now, um, but it's kind of like coming home for me as well. Um, so we were going to get to a point of talking about um, the detox center. Um, but when Ms. Toddy and I talked about this presentation and talked about planning it, we really wanted to uh, offer an explanation to what the needs were to get us to the point of where, why we need the detox center and what services it's going to provide for the community. So if, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to take a few minutes and work through the story of, of what we've seen in Henrico County over almost the past decade and tell you about many of our efforts. And then those efforts, I think, are going to culminate um, with the detox center. And Ms. Toddy is going to talk quite a bit about the detox center. So um, going back to, to about 2014 to 2016, we started realizing in our county that, that we had a problem. And, and I think we were actually a little bit ahead of the curve in realizing that we had an addiction crisis, that we had a heroin crisis, that we had overdoses that were starting to spike, that we were starting to, to see deaths coming, um, coming at, at rates that were unlike any time before. And, and Laura and I was the prosecutor at that time, like you heard, in charge of drug cases. And, and Laura was the director of, of mental health services. And, and among us of other people, we really started trying to look at what can we do um, to, to try to intercept this problem, to try to do something to change things. And boy, I wish we were a lot more successful in doing things, but there were a lot of uh, factors that were out of our control. Um, but I think that each step along the way is going to bring us to the point where you're going to see that the detox center, I think, is going to really help with this problem. Um, so one thing that we have realized is that the scope and the dynamic of what we were looking at has changed a lot since 2014, 2016, 2018, some of the, of the points where we really started planning and doing our efforts. Um, at that time, it was primarily opiates. It was primarily heroin and primarily drugs that are in the heroin family and the opiate family that we were identifying as causing problems. Um, that has changed over the years. And I'm gonna tell you in a few minutes, talk in a few minutes about these changes. But as you'll see, uh, just looking at a 12 month period of time from October of 2020 to October of 2021, nationally, we've seen 105,700 overdose deaths that number, unfortunately, has gone up and not gone down over the years. And, and the change that you're going to see, and I'm going to offer some explanation for it in a few minutes, but the change that you'll see is that the drug that is causing these deaths have changed. They're not just opioids anymore. Um, they are now psychostimulants, primarily methamphetamine being that drug. That's enhanced, obviously, the, the, the different drugs are causing these problems. That's enhanced the pool of people that we're seeing and interacting with. And that's enhanced the need for us to, to sort of adjust on the fly, change what we're doing, and devote more resources to this problem. Uh, just to give you an idea about methamphetamine and, and why I'm, I'm so um, emphasizing the role of meth methamphetamine and driving the problems that we're having. In 1999, nationally, there were 608 deaths that were attributed to methamphetamine usage. By 2021, that had increased to 52,397. So 61.7% um, of methamphetamine deaths in 2021 involved a mix of methamphetamine and either heroin or, or fentanyl. And fentanyl obviously is a chemical substance that's driving a lot of our problems because it's being mixed with a lot of other drugs. Um, you hear a lot about fentanyl on the news. Um, don't really know what it looks like. Obviously fentanyl started as a medical treatment. You can still go to, to the doctor for pain and get fentanyl patches, but fentanyl is a chemical compound that's manufactured primarily in China shipped to Mexico and then brought across the border, you'll hear about what is a lethal dose of fentanyl. That picture really gives you an idea, gives you some insight. It is less than the point of a pencil is a potential lethal dose of fentanyl. So if you see on the news, 
you know, these these stops with with trucks with pounds of, of fentanyl or large baggies of fentanyl, this gives you some sort of insight as to the amount of destruction that that drug can cause. So where is fentanyl found? Um, in the United States, 50% of the deaths involving heroin, the, the, the drug included fentanyl in the mix, likewise cocaine. 50% of the deaths that involve cocaine include fentanyl. 25% uh, um, of the methamphetamine deaths, where it's just pure methamphetamine, not mixed with heroin or another substance, include fentanyl. Um, but really, a, a lot of the concern that we address, not that we're not concerned about the top three bullet points, but a lot of the concern that we have to address in our community are the next couple bullet points, which are the fake pills that are on the street. And these are, are the pills that we're worried about getting into the hands of our citizens, our children, uh, as well as other citizens. These are a lot of the pills that are sold on the black market at certain amounts. And I'm gonna show you in the next few slides what these pills look like. Um, and, and the difficulty is that kids in particular don't know what it is they're buying. They don't know what it is that they're ingesting. Um, and, and it's driving some of these really scary addiction as well as overdose numbers that we're seeing. Likewise, down at the bottom, two slides, two, two bullet points that also concern us is that we're seeing more and more of fentanyl substances and other chemical substances being mixed in with vaping products. And we're seeing these substances being mixed in with marijuana. Um, so what to kids, or to young people may seem as an innocuous substance that they're taking has the potential, you saw with the previous slide, how little a potential lethal amount of fentanyl is, but the fact that fentanyl can be mixed in with these products as well can make those products lethal. Um, so the next couple of slides, just to give you some, some examples on the uh, right side are what the oxycodone pills look like that are manufactured by the pharmaceutical manufacturer on the left side. Uh, they're the fake pills, those pills that have been pressed uh, in, in Mexico, sometimes even in the United States, and oftentimes are just pressed fentanyl. And you can't really see a lot of difference between the two. So somebody who's buying off of the street or buying from a drug dealer, what they expect to be an oxycodone pill, may be buying just pressed fentanyl. Xanax, another drug that's popular, uh, particularly with kids. Um, Xanax ha has um, psychotropic effects. Uh, for people that take it, um, on the left side is what a real Xanax pill looks like. On the on the right side is a fake Xanax pill. Again, really, that's really nothing but pressed fentanyl in that pill. Um, Adderall as well, an another drug that's that's prone for abuse. That's also often sold on the black market. Um, right side are what the real Adderall pills look like. A little bit of difference. Um, you, you can tell that on the left side those pills aren't as as closely manufactured aren't as tightly manufactured as the pills on the right, but still close enough that when somebody's buying uh, fake Adderall pills, they may not know what exactly it is they're buying. Uh, the DEA has really tried to get out in front of this issue and really has tried to educate the public, and that's an effort that, that we through the Addiction Task Force are doing as well. Um, the DEA lab laboratory testing now reveals that six out of 10 Fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills contain a potentially lethal dose. Six out of 10 of those pills that I showed you uh, that are being sold on the street contain a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. This word has to get out. We want our kids, we want our young people, we want all of our citizens to know the potential lethality of what they're taking. If they're buying something off the street, if they're buying something from a drug dealer, if they're taking something from a friend, if it's not prescribed by a doctor, if it hasn't come from a pharmacy, you're taking a six out of 10 chance that what you're, what you're taking, what you're ingesting has the potential to kill you. So as we evolve through working through these problems, starting to see what we were being, what we were being addressed in our community, starting to see these problems, starting to see overdoses and, and the children getting younger and younger with the overdoses and starting to, to become more concerned about our citizenry, uh, we started researching and said, what can we as a community do? And, and we were trying to get out in front of this. Again, we, we, this was before everything hit the news. This was before the word fentanyl was a word that everybody uh, in the country knew. We were trying to figure out what we could do and we did some research and we looked at what the, the CDC suggested for what an overdose response for a community should be. And, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes about the various steps and where that got us to, because that's where the detox center 
comes in. So the first thing that we did was expand and strengthen our surveillance and prevention efforts. One prevention effort is what I just did for the past few minutes. It's talking about these pills, talking about fentanyl, talking about the lethality, talking about the fact that when you buy something, you may not know what it is. So we got out and we continue to get out and try to educate our community about what we're looking at. Uh, but as important to our efforts was starting to work with our first responders, with our police department, our sheriff's office, our fire department, and developing data in terms of what was happening, where it was happening, and how could we focus our efforts on that. Um, and I'll show you some slides as to what some of that data looks at, looks like. So once you start developing that data, you develop your over, overdose surveillance efforts, then you focus on what, what evidence-based responses do we have? How do we connect people with services? What can we do to help them? And again, you're going to hear quite a bit more about the detox center, and that's one of those responses. What can we do to change the playing field and make this look differently? Um, how do we pair this information that we're collecting with what our response is so we can make those numbers try to go down? Um, the next step is then to enhance and expand your ability. You've got some information. You've got some ideas. Okay, let's start putting all of that together. Let's start developing plans and let's look ahead. Let's be prospective. Let's guess about what's coming next. And, and not to give myself a pat on the back, but the trend of seeing stimulants become a problem, the trend of seeing cocaine, methamphetamine become a problem. Again, we were ahead of that before the rest of the country re really realized what was going on. Back in 2019, 2020, we were talking about cocaine is going to become a problem for our country because these drugs are going to be mixed in. Methamphetamine is going to become a problem for our country because these drugs are mixed in. We were seeing that data already. We were already getting that information. One of the things that Ms. Toddy is going to tell you about is that at a point we changed our focus from just being a heroin task force to an addiction task force because we knew what was coming. And that was because we were basing our conclusions on data that we had on treatment and on speaking to the people that we knew were struggling with substance use disorder. Um, and then the fourth step is to use your data con to continuously improve your prevention activities. You, you, you make some progress, but you gotta keep going and you gotta keep refining it. You can't just say, hey, great, we figured out that stimulants was gonna be the next problem. You've gotta continue to look, what's the next trend? And you gotta continue to refine your understanding of, of what's going to happen. Examples like use of medication in treating addiction. That's something that five years ago wasn't done, wasn't heard of. People weren't doing that. Now Henrico is on the forefront of using medication as part of our response to, uh, to overdose prevention. So with our data, I, I kind of hinted at it already. We track data from both the Henrico Division of Police and Division of Fire, and I'll also include the Sheriff's Office and folks that are being admitted into jail. We track their data as well. We also track data from the CDC and from the Virginia Medical Examiner's Office. What we find, though, is that CDC data and some of that medical examiner office data tends to lag a little bit behind what we're tracking from the police department and the fire department. So we like relying on our data more than the national data, than what you'll see on websites, things like that, because we think our data is it gives a more accurate reflection of what's going on in the community. And there also aren't the delays where data is going from our police to the medical examiner's office to the CDC and then coming up on a website. So uh, most of our decision making over the past five years or so has been based on data that we've collected from our fire and our, and our police, our first responders. Um, so to give you some idea of what we're looking at, this is just giving you a, a little bit of a snapshot on the past two years. Um, last year, 2022, uh, Henrico suffered 551 overdoses with 73 of those overdoses being fatal, 73 lives uh, that were taken from us because of this, of this insidious disease or of addiction. Um, talking about this year already, we've had 100 uh, overdoses today, and we've had 19 fatal overdoses. Um, kind of interesting, and, and, and I like thinking about this and looking at, at this somewhat, um, to give you a little bit of insight into the frequency of the usage that res results in these overdoses, as well as talking about resonance. And you're going to find, um, this is the 2022 data, 69% of the folks that were interacted with by Henrico Fire and Henrico Police, it was the first time that they had been interacted with in an overdose situation. But the flip side of that is that 31%, so a significant amount 
of folks that police and fire are responding to overdose calls for um, had multiple overdoses. And sometimes those multiple overdoses were the same day. Sometimes they were two and three in the same day or several over the course of the weekend. Um, so when you see that high number for frequency, you've got to, again, adjust. Take that data and say, what are we doing? Why are we having these circumstances where police come out and respond or in Reiko Fire come out and respond and provide some sort of connection or try to provide some sort of connection so that we can cut off and when they won't be in that 31% number? And again, Ms. Toddy's going to talk a little bit more about what some of those responses are. Um, this last year, the number of Henrico residents versus non-Henrico residents, um, it's kind of interesting. It's interesting because the number is going to be different for this year. Last year, 73% of the overdoses were Henrico residents, 27% non-Henrico residents. Comparing that to this year to date, you're going to see the frequency number is exactly the same, 69% and 31%. And I'll tell you, over the course of five years or so, that number really hasn't changed very much. Um, but look at the difference in the residency number. We've had a huge increase of non-Henrico residents that are um, in situations where Henrico police and Henrico fire are responding to overdoses. So what's going on with that? And that's, that's something that we have to investigate. That's something we have to figure out. Why is it that so many more non-Henrico residents are in situations this year in Henrico County with medical emergencies? And when I talk about tracking data, examining it, coming up with reasons, that's one of the, the tasks of the Addiction Task Force is to sit down and look at data like this and try to come up with reasons why this is happening and then see what we can do to interrupt this from happening. This slide um, gives you two really important data points. Um, on the left side, it tells you that Henrico Division of Fire has administered, or administered last year 498 doses of Narcan. Narcan is the drug that reverses an overdose. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Narcan. We're going to talk about Narcan training and Narcan availability uh, at the end of the presentation. The, the picture on the right, though, is something called a heat map. And, and that is a, that's a data point, a data collection system that allows our first responders to track where the largest number of overdoses are occurring in our county. That allows Ms. Toddy's agency to invest more resources in that area. That allows police to look at it and say, was well, there something going on here? Is there, are there some new drug dealers that are pushing some, some more lethal drugs in these areas? That allows fire to be more prepared and, and know what addresses they have to get to as quickly as they can get to. That allows everybody to stock more Narcan or other services. And that allows us to partner with some of our, our community partners to focus on folks in these areas and say, hey, we're seeing in these particular areas at this given point in time more problems here. How can we focus on this again so we can interrupt uh, what we're seeing in terms of the number of overdoses and the drug usage in those areas? Um, so I'll ask Ms. Toddy to, to step up here and she's going to walk you through some of the history of what we've done with the task force. So Mike really did an excellent job kind of laying the foundation for the work that we um, have been doing. And quite honestly, we could sit up here and talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, so we will try to succinctly go through and, and give you just a, just a taste of some of the things we've been doing. The county, manager, the county manager appointed the heroin task force, and you heard Mike talk about the change in the language. So in 2016, it was really heroin. That's what we were focused on. Um, and it was uh, the county's effort to really join all departments together um, to work on addiction um, and, and address the issue. We had all been working, like Mike said, independently, um, but this was the, the, the real kind of turning point that we needed to, to work together. So you had social services, you had court services, you had um, mental health, you had the health department. Uh, we brought in um, all of our first responders, so all of those folks working together, um, trying to to work. We we did a whole lot around prevention, um, just like he said. It was doing talks like this. So back in, in 2016, 17, 18, it was not a week that went by that we weren't out in the public um, doing some type of presentation. And often it was the health department, it was mental health, and it was the police um, doing the conversation together. So you heard it from all different perspectives. 
we hosted um, a, a number of, of summits and um, and uh, both for Henrico County, and then we sponsored a regional summit um, to try to to get the the information out. We created a website in partnership with Henrico County Public Schools. We got the students to help us work on this website, Bounce Back HC, um, and and uh, tried to put. Uh, really relevant information. What we have found over the years, it's really hard to keep a, a website up to date because the information changes all the time. So one of the things we've done this year is um, have created a, a way for our um, our partners because it really is all of us working together. Um, so the recovery community to be able to update their own information in real time as things change in the website. Uh, and we want to refresh the website. So we have also, again, partnered with Henrico County Public Schools. Uh, in the fall, we have a group of students that are going to take on um, really looking at the, the website. So I, I am going to go off on tangents a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, we, the county manager, after several years of the, the heroin task force, convened a roundtable. And this was Henrico County um, departments and also the public. Um, private sector. So you had all of the major uh, hospital associations um, meeting. You had um, folks from um, different organizations, just really top folks pulled together to say, what are you seeing? What can we do? How can we make a difference? They met nine different times and had presentations. Um, and from that, did field trips, Had we went um, to, to um, all the Hamrico programs, but also many community programs too, to gain information. And from that came several recommendations, 12 recommendations um, to go forward. We were ready to, to implement those recommendations and then the pandemic happened. So there was a, a slight pause, not in, in, in the, the work, but just, um, you know, it was, you, you remember back in, in March of uh, 2020, and uh, our fiscal year started in July of 2020. And it was, uh, you know, we were uncertain at that point about some of the financial decisions that we were doing. Uh, and so we really went after grants and, and, um, and one-time funding to be able to start some of these um, different programs. Out of that recommendation came the recommendation for a detox center. We changed the name um, again to um, from the heroin task force to the addiction task force. We have three committees that are, are meeting uh, and um, prevention, treatment, and diversion. Prevention, you know, it is it's all things about trying to help people have the information that they need um, to reduce the risk risk factors and um, enhance the protective factors that they have. So updating the website is one of the things. Revive training is the training that Mike just talked about with the Narcan, reversing the effects of an overdose. Having mock boxes so people can lock up their medication. Sponsoring um, events where um, uh, drug take back days. Henrico does it twice in partnership with the DEA. Um, both in the fall and usually in um, in April, so that if families have medications they no longer need, they can turn them in and they're they're destroyed safely. They don't get into our water system, um, but just taking them out of circulation, out of the hands of of somebody that does not need them. We have um, overdose prevention kits that we've been working on to give folks who are coming out of jail or coming out of recovery residents in case they do use again, that they can have, they have things like um, fentanyl um, testing strips, you know, so they can test what they're using to see if there's fentanyl in it, just to try to prevent the overdoses. And we partner a lot with Henrico County Schools. One of the programs that we do is Hidden in Plain Sight. Uh, and this is where um, a, a, a bedroom of an adolescent is designed um, and talk about where things might be hidden or what to look for if you're a parent um, that you might suspect that your child uh, is, is using some type of substances. We also rely heavily on uh, our jail folks and inmates 
um, who have been through um, often, you know, just the, the cycle of of um, of jail, getting out, getting clean, starting using again, coming back again. And these folks really have a very powerful message um, and have been really well received by both the students and the parents um, in, in the school system. We do other types of things. This is just a snapshot. So one of the other things we do is we worked again regionally um, with our, our, our partners in, in Chesterfield and Richmond around a spike alert. So if we have uh, a, a series of overdoses that's happening in Central Virginia, the health department will come out with a message just letting the public know um, so folks might know that there's a bad batch of whatever um, in our area to be careful. With treatment, it, it really is making sure that folks can access treatment um, and, and, you know, this has to be when they're ready to access treatment. You know, it, we can want somebody to get treatment. Ms. Zabannon talked about earlier, you know, people calling and saying, can you put my um, son, daughter into jail? Can, you know, how can we get help? Uh, and we can do some of those things, but until, unless somebody wants to get help, often is not successful. The other thing we know is that treatment often has to happen more than one time, uh, that relapse is part of addiction, uh, and that, um, you know, we just have to be prepared to, to work through that. So we've done a number of different things. We have hired peer recovery specialists to work alongside our clinicians. These are individuals with lived experience, so they have been down this road of addiction. Um, and um, are on the other side, often they can share information with an individual um, and they can hear it in a way that a clinician, um, they have more credibility in some ways. There's, there's not treatment. It goes hand in hand with the treatment. We have um, in the back, I put some, some bands, some blue bands um, that has uh, UMatter and, um, and a telephone number on there. We have contracted with UMatter that um, if a, a police officer or, um, or a first responder um, comes across somebody that needs some help and they might not want help right that second, we can give them this bracelet and they can call when they're ready. We just went through and trained all the police officers uh, and firefighters um, in February. Uh, and have seen good results from, from these. We have some opioid abatement money. This is the, the settlement agreement with pharmaceutical companies that have come in. We are looking at two different areas right now. One is medication-assisted treatment, or MAT. And this is, um, a, again, it's, it's a tool. It's, it's one of the, the, the things that we have available to help folks that are, um, are in recovery. Um, what we want to do is to have a mobile response, so we're going out into the community um, versus folks having always to, to walk into our door to get it. So trying to engage people at an earlier, um, earlier in the process. We also know that um, uh, pregnant and parenting women have, have um, many more obstacles than, than some other folks. Uh, so one of the things, if they're in a recovery home and they have a child or they're pregnant, the, the child can't be in the recovery home. And um, often there are many barriers. They might have uh, charges against them. They might have um, increased debt that they can't get an apartment on their own. So we want to create a situation uh, with the recovery homes where um, we develop a program that works both with the, the woman and also with the child for a longer period of time. And so instead of, you know, a couple of months, maybe a year, and then uh, as they go through, try to assist in helping them to get a more permanent um, housing arrangement. We have the CHIRP program. Yay, thank you. Um, Community-based housing in the recovery. Community-based housing in the recovery process. So we have to have acronyms for everything. We can just say it all out. Uh, and what we're able to do, what we've been able to do is to partner with the um, recovery community 
to um, to go in. We wanted to have really the Hamrico standards. We wanted to be a, a gold standard. We wanted to be a little bit higher expectation than the recovery homes were currently doing. So we have the building inspector and the fire inspector going into these homes and doing um, a, um, an inspection uh, and having a certain um, items that they have to meet. If they meet those requirements, they're kind of above and beyond what they've been traditionally having to do, then we will um, contract with them and we will help to subsidize uh, somebody's stay for a couple of weeks while they um, really get um, get oriented to the recovery home until they can get a job to be able to um, support themselves. So we have 39 residents that are currently in this program and have uh, 91 individuals who have been funded. Talked a little bit about the bands. Again, they're in the back. This is just an example of, of uh, individuals who um, officers were, um, were with and um, called back and, and had a good response. So in addition to the other two committees, the third committee that was created was the diversion committee. And, and I chaired that committee um, through my role with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. And, and it really was a focus on identifying the, the, the fact that there were a lot of people that were in jail, that were in jail due to their addiction, and we needed to do something different, that, that they weren't going to get better sitting in jail, and um, they weren't going to get the help they could. And what we really wanted to do was break that revolving door cycle of people coming in and out of jail based on, on their addiction. Probation violated violations is really the biggest driver of what we're talking about, um, but also people that, that were involved in, in drug-related crimes. Um, so we started to pair with folks in the treatment community and folks in the recovery community in this area and, and really started to focus efforts on diverting people out of the jail and into more supportive environments. But we had to do it in a fashion that would ensure public safety. We couldn't just say, go there, good luck, you know, hopefully everything works out all right. First of all, we wanted to sh show the support for folks that were in those, those structures. And we also wanted to make sure that they were where they were supposed to be, that they were staying uh, at those locations. Um, and, and that was quite a burden really to, to keep up with. And so, so your board of supervisors understanding that problem um, created a position uh, of a person who's actually embedded with the common attorney's office, and that is her job uh, to monitor folks in diversion, to help them connect, to help uh, produce the resources, make sure the connections are being made, um, but also to make sure that that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, staying in touch with people they're supposed to be doing and living where they're supposed to be living. Um, so you, you'll see, this is just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of what we're talking about. Since April the 1st of 2022, 194 uh, individuals have left the jail, been placed into diversion efforts, um, and had various levels of success. I'm not going to say that everybody was 100% successful, um, but it is coming up with different alternatives and thinking through things differently rather than the just traditional models of people staying in jail. Um, what we also have focused on are the folks that are in jail, that are coming in for, for a variety of crimes, but we know that substance abuse is driving uh, the commission of those criminal, those offenses. And so the jail, the sheriff actually has three separate programs now, and I'm gonna show you another slide in a few minutes in terms of what a plan is for this, but right now there's three uh, separate programs, each of which are designed to help folks um, that are in jail because of issues arriving arising out of their substance use. Um, and the idea is to get them started in these programs and then create a warm handoff uh, where they go to a treatment or a recovery option afterwards. The first is the RISE program, Recovery in a Secured Environment. That's a very short in duration uh, program, hopefully less than three months or so. The second similar uh, duration, three to four months, is the medication-assisted treatment pod, and, and that is a, a specific pod of the jail that's designed to connect folks with medication to assist with the addiction, but also to have programming and, again, to develop that 
relationship so that when the person leaves jail, they can continue on their medication and have a provider that's providing services as well as counseling. And the last program, program that dates back several years, is the ORBIT program, which is for folks that the judges give longer sentences to 18, 24, even up to 36 months or so. And it's a program with multiple steps along the way, including at the end of, of the sentence, home incarceration. So the idea is that somebody works through the steps to get to the point where they are actually serving the end of their sentence, going to work, living at home, uh, fulfilling responsibilities. So they walk out of jail, they've got a job, they've got a plan, they've got a support network. Um, and having that transitional phase has, has proven to be a very successful. Like everything else, it's a program that's got derailed when the pandemic, pandemic happened, but one that the sheriff is working very hard to get back on track. And the last thing to talk about within the, the efforts of the Diversion Committee is something that I really have been trying to get going for a couple of years. I said, I said earlier today, it sounded like I've been talking about this for 10 years, but actually it's about four years of actually getting a day where court is closed, where court is shut down, and we bring in all the judges and we bring all the attorneys in. And we teach the judges and the attorneys about what resources are there, what options are there, what programs exist, something more, more dragged out than, than this conversation, but really to give the judges and the attorneys ideas of what options are there so that we're all talking off the same page of music and we all have the same idea that there are options and there are plans other than just using jail. So I, I said, I, I really hope as, as we consistently through the past couple of years with our efforts have been at the forefront of different ideas. This is really the idea that we're working on right now that we want to model and want to have other jurisdictions adopt. And this is starting when somebody is admitted into the jail for whatever, probation violation, a criminal offense, whatever the reason is they're admitted into jail, not just using the jail for them to sit and then use the revolving door process. But upon intake into jail, conducting an evaluation. What are the substance use needs? Why did the inmate come in? What the, what's the history there? Is there a physical problem? Is there a medical problem that's leading to drug usage? And can we interrupt that medical problem? Uh, the second step is going to be a referral to a recovery plan coordinator. The Henrico Sheriff's Office is going to hire two using our opioid abatement funds uh, this year to start working on developing a recovery plan for somebody who has newly been admitted into jail. Um, that recovery plan coordinator is going to gather background information from providers, from first responders, from everybody been involved, and there's going to develop a recovery plan. That's going to be a plan that can be presented to the judge. This is the plan for the next step. This is why you can be confident um, that this person can be released into this situation. While this is all being developed, we're going to hope that the, uh, the, the, the individual is engaging in some of that jail-based programming that I talked about, particularly the medication-assisted treatment, if that's an option, or the RISE program, and then a release, but not just a release of, here you go, here's the door to the jail, good luck to you, but a release to a supportive process in the community, pairing with our recovery partners, pairing with our treatment partners, and trying to find the right people to connect folks with so that we can get out of that revolving door situation that we've had. One of the gaps that we found um, when we were doing our recommendations was really around detox, that there wasn't available detox for individuals who needed that level of care. Uh, and what we found is that, uh, you know, it, often it, would, it, it could be, a, you know, a, a wait, it could be a long wait, weeks before somebody could get in. Sometimes they would have to leave the community to go to a, another place, uh, Southwest Virginia. We had somebody talk about uh, this uh, afternoon when we were doing this talk, you know, going to different states. That's not unheard of. Um, but just the, the, the detox was just not available. So with the support of the Board of Supervisors, um, the recommendation of the roundtable was to, to build a detox center. Uh, we are in the process of, of, um, of finding a center right now. The, the Board of Supervisors has um, appropriated the money. Um, we are, um, have um, an architect that's, that's working on the, the drawings um, and the design of the building. Uh, we also want to have an operator. We don't want, to, we want a partner to operate the program for us. 
And so we've been out on a request for proposal. Um, we're going to go back out uh, and, and, and try again. We have, um, have tweaked it a little bit, but somebody to operate the program. So this site, this is a drawing. This is what it will be, what look like similarly. It is on Nine Mile Road next to the um, East um, Government Center right there on Nine Mile Road. Uh, and Henrico Mental Health also has an office just right down from there within walking distance of that site. What we envision is really a warm, welcoming environment. Um, folks can come in in a variety of different ways. It's a voluntary program, so nobody's going to be held there against their wishes. Um, so one of the questions today, if somebody comes and they want to leave, we're going to do our best to try to talk them into staying. But if somebody wants to leave, we're not, we can't stop them from, from leaving. They can come on their own. Uh, so we have a lot of folks that say, you know, this is the time I need to do something right now. Uh, from my experience, that doesn't usually happen Monday through Friday from nine to five. It's usually, you know, Friday night at 11 o'clock because somebody says this is the time. Uh, so we really want it to be open and, and to be able to take admissions 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So somebody can come on their own. They can be referred from their, um, from their therapist. They can be referred from a, by a family. They can come with police. They can come with first responders with um, EMT uh, if they come across somebody and, and they're talking with them and they're ready to, to enter this type of treatment. It is, um, it's really a, a medical detox. Uh, so folks are going to be in for five to 10 days, average really around five days. So it's not a long-term stay, um, but really just to get through those first initial days, uh, make sure that they're healthy and then to help to, um, to move them out into the community. What we feel like we can do in Henrico is um, we, can, we can offer those community services with lots of partners. So we have treatment um, providers that are partners. We have the recovery homes that are, are partners, and it's going to take all of us to be able to, to implement this, um, this design. What we don't want to happen is that somebody goes through detox and there's nothing available for them. You know, then, then, then you, it's, that's waste um, because they're just going to go back out. If they go back out into the same environment, most likely they're going to continue to use. To, um, and so we want to make sure that there's case management, that there's a recovery home, if, if that's what they need, that there's treatment available for them, that there's intensive treatment, if that's what they need. Um, it could be the, the, the CHIRP program that we, we just talked about, helping to uh, make sure that they have housing. We had a question earlier today about, you know, would families be involved? And we absolutely believe it, it really, you know, you, you need your support system. You need families to be involved. So absolutely, uh, there will be a place for families to come in and, and, um, and help. There will be a place for, um, for meetings like NA and AA to happen there. So folks from the community coming in, making connections, um, so that when folks are ready to, to go out, uh, again, they have those connections to help them be successful. We anticipate um, between 32 and, and 36 individuals at, at one time. Uh, we want um, a really kind of a, a dedicated number of beds for Henrico County and then some beds for the region. So we really envision this um, being open to the region. We did have a consultant. We worked with the Master Center um, around the size of the detox center. Uh, and so feel like we have really good data around the design and what this area needs for a detox center. So the, the last thing we just want to mention is the revive training. This is the training for, um, for Narcan that Mike was talking about. It really, it reverses the effects of the overdose. It's a training that we provide, and a couple of examples of, of some times. Um, we will come out into the community. We will do it wherever, you know, that the individual is, um, you know, to a PTA meeting, to a community meeting, to a book club meeting, you know, whatever it is, we will come out and provide this training. And what it is, it gives you, 
both the the skills. Think about you know first aid. Think about some of those those um, just easy things you can do to help save somebody's life. This is not treatment. It's not gonna you know it's not the end all when you when you use the Narcan. You need to be calling nine one one because the person still needs to go to the hospital um, to to get the care that they need. But it will reverse the effects of the um, overdose. What we have found, what the um, EMS have found, is that um, if they come across somebody who is non-responsive, um, they will go ahead and give the Narcan. Uh, because if, you, if you're having a heart attack or if you're having some other types of things, it won't harm you. Um, but if you're in an overdose, it will absolutely save your life. So again, it's, it's an easy training and it's, it's easy to use. Um, it is um, it is available now over the counter. Mike um, shared that earlier, it, as of yesterday. Um, so it is easy to get. Um, so I really would really encourage all of you to to have it. So we had a staff person. I'll give you an example, who had it, who was at a grocery store and walked by and saw somebody slumped over in their car, you know, and went into the grocery store and came back out and they were still slumped over in their car. And um, and they were in an overdose, you know, and we're able to call and get the person help. So it's it's really that type of situation. It might not be anybody in your family, um, but you heard the number of folks that are overdosing in our community um, and how many people are dying. Any questions? I do want to mention that there are several programs that the county does. We are really trying to address this issue. Um, we have drug court. The judges um, take some of the people on the, um, is it the RISE program or the or Orbit? Both RISE and Orbit. Uh, these are people who are in the jail, not because they took the drugs, but because they stole something to buy drugs or they hurt somebody to get drugs. And um, you mentioned that um, that they are speakers sometimes for some of the, uh, the programs that are, there are. But it's amazing when you see that these folks, they've decided they've got to get off drugs and they are in front of a judge. And each week they come and talk to the judge and they are given a, um, a test, a drug test to see if they're, it's usually a urine or a, um, I think it's just a urine test. Oh, yeah. And, um, and the the person will stand up in front of the judge and it's almost as if it's their mom and dad, you know, that's talking to them. You did a good job this week. You know, you, you stayed off drugs and here's a gift for you. And the next person came up and would come up and um, they said, you didn't pass your drug test. You're back to jail. So and it's it's just a real, I think, a very effective way to help folks. I've been to many of the graduations. Um, I didn't, I failed to acknowledge someone that's here in the audience, and that's Heidi Barshinger. And Heidi, raise your hand. <laughs> she is the clerk to the county, the county clerk. And she did a program for us in October, and you can pull it up on YouTube, and it was about wills and probate. It was excellent. Uh, she is an elected official, and um, just thought I'd acknowledge she's here. Thank you for coming. Um, our next speaker. Debbie Lumpkin, and she is going to talk about um, the internships that are available. And this is interesting if you have children that you want to put to work <laughs> or you have a grandchild that you think might be interested in the many different things that happen in counties and the type of things they might want to do for a living, that she's your person to contact. So here she is. Ms. O'Bannon, thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you all for coming out. It's nice to see you here and that you've taken a little time to spend with us and learn about some of our important programs. Um, our internship program provides opportunities to our students to learn, gain experience, grow their skills, and learn about poten potential careers that exist in local government while serving their community. We have always hired students for some time, but in 2012, we formalized a program to hire students. We hire students, high school, college, and graduate level students, but we are the only local government 
in the Richmond metro area that offers both paid internships and for academic credit internships to both colleges and high school students. We host college students year round and in the fall and spring, typically those semesters our opportunities are for academic credit and they are for college students only. However, in our summertime, it is the largest semester that we hire. We hire both high school students that have paid internships and college students that have paid or academic credit. Typically, we host 50 or 60 students throughout our summer semesters. And one thing about our students, when they come and join us for the summer, we learn as much from them as they learn from us. It's, it's really a give and take kind of relationship. We hire about 50 to 60 students. That number seems to be going a little bit higher, but many of them work beyond that summer. What happens is they become engaged, engaged in the work. We learn what they're capable of. We give them more and more. They find they like it. They return, they go back to school, they come back over their winter breaks, their spring breaks, and then the following summer. So um, it's good for them and it's good for us. Our program is unique because we do aim to meet um, career development goals of the students that are tied directly to their learning goals while we balance the needs of our department and the reason why they've hired the students. So um, our program has been recognized um, both locally and nationally by the National Association of Counties and the Virginia Association of Counties. Um, as this slide shows, um, to date, we have hired 735 interns. Um, they've been hired through the spring. 129 of them have worked across their original semester, across 28 different agencies of the county. And this number, this one I'm getting ready to say, is already outdated because I know we just happened to hire three former interns last week. Um, 96 former interns have been hired into full-time positions with the county with 88 of them working directly in general government, and eight of them have joined us in our school offices in some type of way. So we hired three additional students last week um, into full-time roles. Um, some of our opportunities this summer that you'll see for are for our high school students. And we are hiring 24 to work throughout 10 different departments. The application process started February 16th. We will be accepting applications through April 10th and these students will start on June 13th. So we're looking for students to work in our circuit court clerk's office, our extension office, general services to work in maintenance and in auto maintenance, our information technology department, in our libraries, in our administrative office, at our Sandston Library, Tuckahoe Library, within mental health and developmental services, at their office in the east and west, along with public utilities, they're hoping to teach students how to make dirty water clean and make sure our water is safe to drink. Um, they will have students at the water reclamation and at the water treatment facility. Our public works will also have students as well and recreation and parks will seek students. Our college internships, they are advertised a month in a, a semester in advance on our job site and students do apply. We started that process for our college students in December with all of those vacancies and opportunities applications due through this month. And so many of those we are currently interviewing and hiring students now. There have been a couple opportunities that have cropped up in the last week or two, so there still are a few out there that'll be there through um, a little later in April. But for the most part, college opportunities are finished for summer. We will put college opportunities for the fall They'll be out on the job site probably in June. Um, so this slide here shows our internship program. I said earlier, our students, we um, have always hired students, but we formalized that process and what it looks like in 2011. We ran a pilot with two students from Henrico County Schools. They worked at our water reclamation facility. Since then, we have clearly grown. Um, you'll see where COVID hit, we kind of took a nosedive, but We've come back pretty strong um, after COVID. And I have no doubt if we're at 80 students for this year, we're definitely going to beat that 102 with these summer hires. So 
um, we're looking forward to onboarding some new students this summer. So as you'll see here, um, so what do our students look like? Of those 735 students, 175 of them are high schoolers, 462 are undergraduates, and 93 of them are graduate level. And then we also have students that are doing some type of practicum or a medical rotation. We've had five of them. And as you'll see, um, the largest portion of our students are undergraduates. And then it goes to a graduate level student high school and then the practicums and medical rotations. 54% of our students are paid while 43% are academic credit. They are college students. Our high schoolers cannot earn academic credit, so they're always paid. Uh, while we have a few, 3% um, of our students earn pay and credit. So our hourly rates here, um, our high school student is currently 1216, college interns 1335, and graduate level 1537. These rates are subject to change. We have a proposal before the board for increased pay rates. So I hope to see this number go up before all of our students get started. A lot of our um, interns do a varied um, assortment of duties. We've had some that have worked on lesson plans and created programs for rec and parks for our libraries. Um, they coordinate and work at sports tournaments. They may serve as HVAC, plumbing calls throughout the county. They may work at our automotive center where they may do oil changes, tire rotations. Um, they work at, again, within public utilities, they might review water and sewer plans. We also have them doing PR and marketing type work where they might take photographs, create videos, they might update websites. They also might work in IT with um, coding and help desk duties. They also may help with um, field inspections, testing our streams and soil and GIS projects and too many more to even think of. So they do a variety of different things. Our experience is our students, we couldn't do it without the staff and the supervisors that work so diligently to provide them the opportunities, give them the mentorship. And I just happen to be the middle person that helps connect all of them, make it happen. So it really brings um, a lot of satisfaction to me when I can share with you comments that students have said about our staff and our program. And I'm just gonna take a second here to read this word for word. Um, county staff went out of their way to integrate me into the office, allowing me to learn as a colleague and as an equal, not simply as an intern. As we start our careers, these internships have provided us with the opportunity to shape ourselves into the professionals we wish to become. Another student wrote, before the summer started, I had heard horror stories about different internships. I really wanted to experience, I really wanted an experience that would excite me and help me with my future. And this experience exceeded my expectations. After this summer, you all have helped me broaden my options. It has been easy to brag about my internship since I've been back to school. Can't think of anything better than that for somebody to say, this was great. And um, we strive to do that for every student that we have. So thank you all for being here tonight. If there's any questions, I'm happy. Yes, ma'am. So graduate st level students, a lot of the opportunities that we have um, are in mental health and developmental services for counseling and also in social services for social work type. We also occasionally have some within the realm of um, community corrections, but usually it's social work for um, or, or mental health counseling. There are also some flyers in the back of the room, so feel free to pick them up. They'll direct you to the um, link to apply. Just scan that QR code. Thank you very much. I think we deserve a round, they deserve a round of applause, our presenters, because they've done a good job tonight.
um, it is, it's uh, 20 minutes of, and, but if, if anybody has any more questions they want to ask, I'll be here for a few more minutes and I can talk and answer questions if you have some for specific other things that you want to ask me about. Thank you very much for being here. And I appreciate all the information to our speakers, all the information they gave to us tonight. But thank you very much for being here. All right, have a good evening.